Hi, this is Andy Turnbull, and in this session I'll be talking about IOR calculations and considerations in patients with keratoconus. So the incidence and prevalence of keratoconus is rising, and keratoconics also tend to develop cataracts earlier than average. So this means that keratoconic cataracts are an increasing problem, and one that we'll all need to deal with from time to time. Now, due to their abnormal morphology, working out what lens to implant in a keratoconic eye is much more challenging than in a normal eye, and the more advanced the keratoconus, the more difficult it becomes. So keratoconus presents a whole array of problems for biometry and IOL calculations. Similar to the situation after refractive surgery, the normal biometric assumptions that we rely on no longer apply. So firstly, the standard keratometric index is no longer accurate. Now this index is a fictitious index that enables a calculation of total corneal power from just the anterior keratometry. And we use this all the time when doing normal lens calculations, but it does rely on the anterior and posterior cornea relationship being within normal limits. Secondly, the measured K doesn't necessarily coincide with the visual axis. And thirdly, the measurement accuracy will vary across the cornea. And finally, the curvature is not constant along a particular meridian. The astigmatism is irregular rather than having nice meridia at 90 degrees to each other. So overall, this leads to an overestimate of the corneal power, an underestimate of the required IOL power, and therefore a hyperopic surprise and an unhappy patient. And this graph here in the bottom right shows that the steeper the Ks, the more inaccurate our calculations in keratoconus become. Now this is with the holiday one, but similar results are to be expected with other formulae. But there's more. So keratoconics often have abnormally deep anterior chambers and long axial lengths, and the AC depth can no longer accurately predict the effective lens position because the normal proportional relationships have been lost. And as you can see in the graphs here, most formulae are already inherently less accurate in eyes with long axial lengths, and the same applies for eyes with abnormally deep anterior chambers or abnormally steep Ks. And obviously all of these are relevant in eyes with keratoconus, so the cumulative potential for error is pretty high. Keratometry also has poor repeatability in keratoconus, and this is partly due to a decentered apex and irregular astigmatism, but also due to tear film instability. It may also be complicated by contact lens wear causing corneal warpage, and the fact that these patients are oft will often struggle to take an adequate contact lens holiday prior to biometry as they're completely dependent on their lenses for functional vision. So just on contact lens holidays for a moment, there are no hard and fast rules about them and advice will vary, but this is an example of what is required. So for soft lenses, a week or two is usually fine. Scleral lenses also only require a few days as they don't have as much contact with the cornea, but hard and rigid gas permeable lenses which many patients with advanced keratoconus may be reliant on, can cause significant warpage, which can take months to fully stabilise. Of course, many patients will be wearing contact lenses post-operatively too, and that's good news because it means we can be a bit more relaxed when it comes to contact lens holidays, as some refractive error will be more easily tolerated. So the final complicating factor is that keratoconus is a continuum from form frust to more severe cases. Milder cases obviously behave relatively similarly to normal eyes, so for the purposes of IOL calculations, when do we start saying an eye with keratoconus requires a modified surgical approach? We don't yet know if a particular cutoff exists or if there's more than one, and we maybe need a variety of approaches. So that sets the scene, and as you can see, it's not easy. But before we move on to formula choice, I thought I'd just touch on lens choice. So monofocal lenses are the most commonly used lenses and certainly what I would recommend in keratoconus, but what should we do about spherical aberration? So while some SA can be useful for depth of focus, having too much can have an adverse impact on quality of vision. Now most normal corneas have positive spherical aberration and therefore we often implant lenses with a negative SA like a J&J Technus or an Alcon IQ to try and optimise visual quality. But keratoconic corneas usually have negative SA, so if we implant our usually negatively aspheric lens, visual quality may well be impacted. So it's probably best to go for a lens with either positive or neutral SA, like the Sensar series from J&J &J or the Envista from Bausch and & Lomb. And what about toric lenses? Well, 
I love turret lenses and I implant them in about 80% of my private cases, but Keratoconus is a completely different kettle of fish. So in a nutshell, they should only really be considered if the patient could achieve good spectacle corrected vision before they develop cataract. If there's a reasonable degree of regular astigmatism, they're not going to need contact lenses postoperatively and their keratoconus is definitely stable. And even in these cases, patients should be told that the aim is astigmatism reduction rather than elimination. Now, the reason to avoid Torex in most cases is that they can make contact lens fitting much more challenging and expensive. And the fact that Torex calculations are much less accurate due to the biometry problems and unpredictability with surgically induced astigmatism. And so patients are generally less likely to be satisfied. In cases where you might have wanted to implant a Torex lens, the IC8 from AccuFocus is a relatively new option that may be very effective particularly in eyes with significant irregular astigmatism. So this lens consists of a pinhole aperture and is used in the same way as a simple monofocal lens. So the, inv the advantage is that it compensates for the highly aberrated cornea by blocking out a lot of light coming from the periphery. It increases depth of focus and it's tolerant of residual refractive error. So it's certainly worth thinking about in very irregular eyes or complex eyes where IOL calculations are extremely challenging. Um, so not just keratoconus, but, you know, for example, eyes that have undergone several previous corneal procedures, post-graft patients or um, post-cross-linking and uh, ring segments. And finally, in this section on lens choice, I'll just mention multifocals. I would recommend avoiding them in patients with anything other than very mild keratoconus. There have been some reports of success in small groups of patients, but in my opinion, the higher order aberrations that are present in these eyes and the almost inevitable refractive error post-op and the fact you can't usually do a laser enhancement um, to, to correct their refractive error mean that these will often be poorly tolerated. So I think you're just asking for trouble. So before we move on to the actual choice of formulae, here are just a few general pearls for IOL success in keratoconus. So firstly, don't treat a moving target. Ensure that the keratoconus is stable and cross-link them prior to FACO if necessary. If they're going to need a graft, then do this first and then perform the FACO one stable if you, if you possibly can. Um, otherwise, they're likely to end up very hyperopic afterwards. Obviously, use an up-to-date biometry machine with rapid acquisition. So something like the IOL Master 700 uh, has a much faster acquisition than the 500, which means that there's less variability from tear film breakup. So you're more likely to get accurate Ks. Uh, you can compare multiple keratometers and choose the lowest measured K, and that then predicts the highest powered IOL, again, just to reduce your risk of having a hyperopic surprise. Think about how dependent the patient is likely to be on contact lenses um, afterwards, because if they are going to be needing contact lenses, then it does affect your decision making when it comes to IOL choice. Uh, and to try and minimize your surgically induced astigmatism, if you are using a toric, then a scleral tunnel or a limbal incision is advisable. We should really aim for some degree of myopia with these patients. So there's various reasons for this. I normally target emetropia with, with most of my normal patients, um, but, but you know, this is one, one exception, I think, where, um, where myopia is more useful. So firstly, you get more useful unaided vision with a degree of myopia. Uh, many surgeons will aim for minus two or minus three to reduce the chance of a hyperopic surprise just because of the unpredictability of the lens calculations. If the patient does end up myopic, it actually helps them to see to insert their contact lenses. And it's easier to fit a myopic contact lens than it is a hyperopic one. And also, if the patient subsequently needs cross-linking afterwards, then the cross-linking procedure often causes some flattening and a hyperopic shift. And really, the bottom line is that there's no need to target Plano in these eyes, um, and above all, just manage patient expectations. So the bit you've all been waiting for, which formula should we use? Can we use standard formulae or should we be doing something more high tech? So of the standard formulae, the SRKT has been reported in multiple studies as being the best. But unfortunately, this, do this doesn't mean it's very good. It's more the best of a bad bunch. So in different studies and depending on disease severity, 30 to 60% 30, 30 to 60 sorry, 
of patients have achieved within half a diopter of target. This is compared with non-keratoconic eyes, where around 80 to 90% would achieve within half a diopter uh, using modern methods. So the relative success of the SRKT in keratoconus is more by accident than by design. So in normal eyes, the SRKT tends to result in more myopic outcomes as the keratometry increases, so with steeper corneas. Now this myopic tendency in steeper corneas counterbalances the tendency in keratoconus towards hyperopia. So overall it balances out and, and it ends up being a, a relatively well-performing formula in this scenario. The Barrett Universal, which as we know is one of the most accurate formulae in normal eyes, is also okay um, in keratoconus, but it's still not great. So Martin Watson uh, et al. from Moorfields published a really important paper in the BJO a few years ago highlighting the problems with IOL calcula calculations in keratoconus, and I'd highly recommend reading this if you get a chance. So they used the SRKT and showed that results varied according to the severity of keratoconus. Even in mild keratoconus with a K of less than 48 diopters, they got prediction errors ranging from minus 3 to plus 5. And in severe keratoconus, i.e. a keratometry of 55 diopters or more, errors were huge, and they recommended abandoning the measured K altogether in these cases and using a standard value of 43.25 instead. But even with this approach, accuracy was pretty poor. So in response to these challenges, people have looked at developing specific methods to tackle IOL calculations in keratoconus. You may or may not have heard of the Kane formula, but this is a really great new formula that actually rivals the Barrett Universal for being one of the most accurate in normal eyes. Jack Kane has now developed a modification of his formula for keratoconus, whereby the measured corneal power is modified to reduce its influence on the ELP prediction. Graham Barrett has also recently modified his post-refractive true K formula, making use of the measured posterior cornea to derive the true K KC formula. And finally, Jack Holliday has also made a change to the ELP algorithm of the Holiday 2 formula to allow for the abnormal relationship between axial length and AC depth. So a few interesting options, but do any of them actually work? Jack Kane recently published a comparison of multiple formulae, including his own and the Holiday 2 with KC adjustment. He didn't investigate the Barrett True K KC formula, I think because it wasn't available at the time of uh, performing his study. And they found that the Kane KC was the most accurate overall, but still with only 50% within half a doctor of target. The SRKT, the original Kane, and the original Barrett Universal were the most accurate of the rest, but sadly the Holiday 2 with KC adjustment performed the least well. Based on these results, Kane's recommendation to avoid hyperopia when using his formula was to aim for increasing amounts of myopia depending on the keratometry, as you can see at the bottom here. Barrett's original idea was to use the measured posterior cornea and input this into the standard Barrett Universal formula but he's now evolved this and generated a new algorithm, which is actually more akin to his post-refractive true K formula. And this makes sense, given that one of the major problems with keratoconic calculations is the loss of the normal relationship between the anterior and posterior cornea. And this is the same problem that faces us after previous corneal refractive surgery. And it makes use of a double K method, whereby the measured K is used to calculate the IOL power and a theoretical K is used to predict the effective lens position. And this is a very well-known method when it comes to post-refractive IOL formulae. So for best results, you need to use this formula with the measured posterior cornea, which is available on some new biometry machines, but it will make a theoretical prediction of this if this data is not available. And if you compare the recommendations of the true KKC directly with those of the Kane KC, Barrett's method seems to be a little bit more conservative um, in other words, it recommends an IOL closer to the one that would have been recommended without any KC adjustment. So the initial results from the true K KC seem rather good. 
So this is unpublished data from a series in Israel, which is currently going through peer review and shows 87.5% within half a doctor of target using the true KKC. What I don't know currently is the case mix in this data set and the severity of keratoconus, um, but this is in comparison with the other formulae which all achieved results similar to those in the published literature, suggesting that this data set is probably comparable to others that have been studied. Until the paper is published, obviously, we won't be able to draw any more definite conclusions on this, but it does seem as though Barrett may be onto something with this. He may once again have cracked the conundrum and helped us to make significant progress in this domain. So both of these KC options are now freely available online, um, as you can see there. And I'm certainly going to start using and comparing these from now on, and I'd encourage you to do the same. But what still remains unclear is when we should start modifying our approach. As we said, uh, a cutoff in terms of keratometry or corneal thickness may exist, but we don't really know. And it will only be further study with the um, with far greater numbers using the true KKC and the Kane KC formulae uh, that will help to elucidate this. So to summarize, standard approaches in keratoconus lead to hypropic surprises, and it's preferable for these patients to end up a bit more myopic. The current bulk of evidence suggests that using the SRKT and targeting about minus one to minus two is a reasonable approach, whereas in severe KC, a standard K value may be a safer option. But it does seem now that we have better options than this, and certainly the Barrett True KKC and possibly the Kane KC look to be really exciting options going forward. Thank you very much for your attention.